noise from outside? Outside's fine. All right, so uh, welcome to microarchitectural attacks on trusted execution environments. I'm Keegan Ryan. Uh, so we'll start by going over what trusted execution environments are and to understand that we need to understand the sort of background of processor security and how processors are built. So the model most people are familiar with is uh, the x86 model where there are different rings with different security levels. Uh, we have the ring three, which is the unprivileged user land. And we also have ring zero, which is the privileged kernel. So if the secrets go in the kernel, uh, everything untrusted goes in the user land. There's also ring one and ring two uh, that are nominally for guest operating systems or drivers. But ring one and ring two realistically aren't uh, actually used in modern systems. So we can essentially ignore them. But that runs into the question of what happens if uh, you have secrets in ring zero, but you're worried about ring zero being compromised. What do you do to uh, prevent that? Uh, and the answer is, well, since we have ring three as the least privilege and ring zero as the most privilege, we can't get more privilege than ring zero. So what if we just make a more privileged ring and call it ring minus one? So then instead of keeping our secrets in ring zero, which is where the kernel is, we put them in ring minus one. So now if we have a compromised ring zero, well, we still don't have secrets. But then that raises the question of what happens if your ring minus one is compromised? What if there's a vulnerability in your hypervisor? So we add another ring, ring minus two, and this is a system management mode. So now if your hypervisor is compromised, everything is still okay. Your secrets are still uh, one level up. And again, if ring minus two gets compromised, then you just put your secrets in ring minus three, which is the Intel management engine or uh, Intel AMT. And you just keep on adding more and more rings uh, to keep protecting your secrets more and more. But this becomes problematic. Uh, you can't just keep adding more and more rings. So what happens if instead of putting your secrets in the most privileged ring, what if we put the secrets in the least privileged ring? And that's the whole idea behind SGX. So SGX is a secure enclave, so it's a way to run code and keep secrets securely in ring three. So even if you have a compromised kernel, a compromised ring minus one, minus two, or minus three, your secrets in ring three are going to be perfectly safe. So that's the sort of concept behind SGX. And it may seem a little weird that everything's in the least privileged ring, but uh, Intel tells us it's okay. So here's a slightly simplified view. Uh, we're going to forget about the negative rings for now, and we don't really care about ring one and ring two. Uh, but we can see that the kernel is the most privileged and attacker controlled. Uh, user land is also attacker controlled, and it's only the SGX enclave in ring three that's uh, not directly controlled. But you might wonder, since the kernel usually handles some important things, what happens if there's a page fault, or what happens if there's an interrupt in the enclave? Who should handle that code? Uh, should the kernel be responsible for mapping the memory of the enclave, or should the enclave be responsible for it? So the kernel may be able to map memory for the enclave. Uh, the kernel may be able to do things to the enclave that it is able to do because it has a higher level of privilege, uh, but maybe doesn't make as much sense uh, with the secrets being in the lower privileged ring. So that's x86. Uh, and ARMv8 is completely different. So ARMv8 is what's commonly used in uh, modern high-end cell phones. And they got a few things right compared to x86 right off the bat. So instead of starting at ring zero as the most privileged and having to add negative rings for more privileged levels, uh, they flip it around. So we still have the kernel and the user land, uh, but the user land is at exception level zero and the kernel is at exception level one. So now if we need a more privileged ring or a more privileged level to do things at, we just add exception level two and no more negative numbers. So in ARM, uh, exception level two is the hypervisor and exception level three is the monitor. And we run into the same issue here where what happens if your monitor is compromised but you want to be able to maintain secrets in your system? So instead of putting it in a even higher exception level, uh, the idea behind trust zone was to uh, separate the exception levels into two different uh, components. So instead of uh, separating it by privilege, we separate it by level of trust. 
So the things on the left-hand side of the screen, the hypervisor, the kernel, the user land, are uh, in the non-secure world. And the things on the right are in the secure world. So uh, everything in exception level three is in the secure world. Uh, and then we can also add a secure world exception level zero and a secure world exception level one. So now we can have a real world kernel, which is your Linux or your Android operating system. And then we can have the secure kernel and the secure user land. So that's your trusted OS and your trusted applications. So now this is completely orthogonal to your privilege layers. Uh, it's completely different components. Uh, you could be more privileged but not trusted, or you could be trusted but not privileged. And again, this uh, ends up with weird diagrams where you have the attacker in the untrusted kernel code who's attacking the user land in the trusted kernel code. So we're again moving down this privilege scale, going from more privilege to less privilege and trying to compromise secrets that way. So uh, the creators of the trust zone have the task of trying to protect the uh, lower privileged uh, levels from the higher privileged levels. So the question that this brings up is, are we able to use these uh, privileged modes to attack the trusted execution environments in both SGX and Trust Zone? Since we're operating at a more privileged level within the processor, but we have additional security measures to defeat from this privileged level. And the answer is clearly yes, we can ab abuse this privilege for our own purposes. Uh, and a good example of this is the clock screw vulnerability uh, that was found in, uh, I believe, the Nexus 6 and other modern phones that affected Trust Zone. So the basic idea behind uh, clock screw is that operating systems need to be able to manage power consumption on mobile devices. If the uh, operating system isn't using that many processes, then it can scale back the power consumption of the processor. Uh, and if it's doing a higher intensity task, it can ramp up the power consumption. So the operating system is able to control the voltage and the frequency of the processor. This is important for getting the most out of your battery life. So that means that our untrusted Linux and Android operating system is able to change the voltage and the power and the frequency that goes to the target core. But that target core may be running in the secure mode, it may be running in the non-secure mode, uh, we don't know. So the idea is that the unprivileged operating system will both overvolt or undervolt and overclock the processor so that the processor no longer behaves correctly. The outcome of arithmetic operations will no longer be the correct answer. Uh, it may skip instructions. Uh, basically, your target core won't perform as you would expect it to. And if that target core is running in the secure world, if it's running cryptographic code inside of Trust Zone, this might induce faults and it might induce errors. And from these errors, we can extract private keys. So the clock screw authors were able to use this vulnerability of modifying the power consumption of the secure world to extract private keys and bypass code signing requirements. So clock screw is an example of what we call an active attack, where we're actually modifying the behavior of the privileged code, of the trusted code. Uh, but what I want to look at uh, is known as a passive attack. So where we don't modify the behavior of the trusted code, we just monitor what it's doing. And uh, a good way to do this is through side channel attacks, which arise when the trusted and the non-trusted code share the same underlying hardware. So if the trusted code and the untrusted code share the same cache, for example, then we can see the behavior of the trusted code have its impact on its cache and then monitor what that impact is. So when we uh, observe these side effects of these side channels uh, inside the cache and other structures, then we can use this to infer secrets that are going on in the trusted execution environments. So we're able to use our privileged access to the cache and these other structures to leak information. So what is Intel's approach to these sorts of side channel attacks? What is their solution for how do we protect a processor where a privileged attacker is trying to abuse these microarchitectural structures. And Intel just says SGX doesn't defend against this sort of adversary. Intel doesn't care. It's up to the developer to make sure that their code cannot be exploited in this way. And we all know how well that goes when we uh, tell developers that it's their responsibility to make their code secure. So uh, Intel doesn't try to protect against this sort of attack at all.
Now, in order to understand cache attacks uh, on trusted execution environments, we need to understand cache attacks in general. So that's what I'm going to go over now. For a cache attack, uh, inside the cache uh, in a processor, it, the cache is a way to access main memory in a more uh, efficient way and more quickly. So access from a process on the right to the main memory on the left takes a long time. So uh, when we try to read something, such as at address 4, it takes a long time to read from main memory. But after we read it once, then it's now in the cache, and if we try to read from address 4 again, then we read it from the cache, and that access is quick. If we try to read from uh, another address, such as address 14, again, it's slow the first time we read it, but once it's in the cache, then it's fast again. Same with memory at address 3, it's slow the first time, and then once it's in the cache, it's fast. And you can see so far that everything has moved horizontally in rows. So address 4 is in the first row, 14 is in the third row, and so on. So this is the concept of sets within a cache. Uh, memory can only go into the set where it's assigned. So everything will only travel along one row. So if we try to read something that's in the same row as something that's already in the cache, well, if there's room in that row inside the cache, then it will fill up, up that address, uh, such as when we read address 0 here. Uh, but now we can see that within that first set, there's no more room within the cache. So if we try to read something else, such as address 12, we're going to have to remove something from the cache in order to make room for the data at address 12. So uh, because we have to make room, we have to decide which item to remove from the cache or to evict from the cache. Uh, and for the purposes of the presentation, we can just assume that it's done randomly. Uh, it varies by architecture, but we'll just assume that it's done randomly here. And now that address 0 is evicted from the cache, if we try to read from address 0 again, we have to evict something else from that first set. So the number of entries within a set that we can fill with cache data are called the ways. So this example right here is a two-way set associative cache. So uh, from here, we can start building up the different sorts of attacks. So instead of just having one process, we now have two processes, the attacker process and the victim process. And we're going to assume that they share access to the same memory. So the flush and reload attack works in two stages. Uh, the first stage is the flush stage, where the attacker flushes everything from the cache, so the cache is completely empty in a known and controlled state. And then we let the victim execute for a small period of time. So here the victim will access whatever is at address 1. Uh, that puts uh, the data at address 1 into the cache. And then we enter the second stage of the flush and reload attack, which is the reload stage. So here the attacker tries to reload different addresses within memory. So the attacker tries to load address 0. The attacker observes that it takes a long time to load that data. So the attacker infers that the data at 0 was not in the cache. The attacker then tries to load the data address 1, sees that it occurs quickly. So the attacker infers that the information at 1 is within the cache. But the attacker knows that after the flush phase of the attack, the cache was empty. So the only reason that would lead to 1 being in the, the cache is if the victim loaded whatever was at address 1. So the attacker knows that the victim loaded what was at address 1, so the attacker has some information about what the victim saw. And then the attack repeats. Uh, the attacker flushes again, lets the victim execute for a small period of time, uh, and then the attacker reloads to see which other addresses the victim is accessing. So there's also an extension called flush and flush, where instead of measuring the time it takes to reload a piece of memory into the attacker process, the attacker measures the amount of time it takes to flush it, but it's essentially the same thing. Uh, when the attacker and the victim share memory, the attacker can see which addresses the victim is accessing. We can also look at the case where the attacker and the victim do not share the same memory, uh, and where the memory is separate between the attacker and the victim. So in this case, uh, the prime and probe attack, the attacker first primes the cache by loading attacker data into the cache. So the attacker reads all of their data into the cache, uh, and then lets the victim execute for a small amount of time. So here the victim reads whatever's at address 15, uh, the, and then address 15 goes into the cache. And then for the probe step of the attack, the attacker re-accesses uh, their uh, memory and sees if their addresses are still in the cache. 
So the attacker tries to read what's at address 3, uh, observes that uh, this goes quickly, so 3 is in the cache, tries to read from 7, sees this, takes a while, and the attacker infers that 7 was previously evicted from the cache. So the attacker can therefore know that uh, something from the bottom row, from that bottom set, was accessed by the victim during that time slice. The attacker doesn't know if it was 11, they don't know if it was 15, and they don't know the contents of that memory, but they know that something was accessed from that fourth set. And it turns out that this level of information is often enough for real-world attacks. So to summarize cache attacks, uh, caches are critical for having good performance. Uh, you can't easily get rid of caches and still have decent performance in your processors. Uh, the sense of the attack and the victim share the same structures. Uh, the attack can see the difference in these microarchitectural structures, such as the cache, to infer how the victim is using these structures. And then the attacker can use these differences to learn secrets. Uh, we can use this when memory is shared, such as in the flush and reload and flush and flush attacks. And we can use uh, cache attacks when memory is not shared, such as in the prime and probe attack. So what does this look like in practice? Well, here's an example of a prime and probe attack on an implementation of AES, which is an encryption algorithm uh, done repeatedly. So it's just an AES encryption over and over in a loop. And we can see uh, in this diagram where we have our rows once again representing the different sets. Uh, and we can see time increasing from left to right. So every column of pixels is one slice of time. So one iteration of prime victim execution probe, prime victim execution probe, and so on. And every white pixel is where we know that the victim has evicted something from that set. We don't know what they evicted, we don't know the data there, but we know they evicted something. So we can see repetitions over time here. We can see that uh, this pattern at the bottom is repeated more than once uh, with respect to time, and the pattern at the top is repeated more than once with respect to time. So we can see just by looking at this diagram of the uh, cache attack trace that there is some sort of repetition. Now, what happens if we do the same operation but with two different keys? So uh, it's the same code, uh, same setup, but the uh, trace on the left is with one key, the trace on the right was with a different key. We can see the trace on the right, we still see repetition, but that repetition is different from the left and from the right. And the only thing we change is the key. So if there's some way to go from this difference in the patterns to being able to figure out what the key bytes are, then the cache attack succeeds and we get the secret information. And there are ways to do this with AES. So what sort of metrics do we use to measure how good a cache attack is? And there are basically three different metrics. The first is spatial resolution. So how accurately can you see what memory the victim is looking at? Uh, if you can see within one kilobyte, then that gives you some information. But if you can see within 256 bytes, that gives you even high spatial resolution. So we can see with greater ac accuracy what the victim is accessing. We also want good temporal resolution, which is the measure of uh, how short of a time frame we can measure the victim executing. So if the victim executes for one full second and we can only measure all the memory accesses that happen during that one second, that doesn't tell us as much information as if we could do just one microsecond of execution. And the last metric that we're going to use is noise. So how accurately do your measured values confer to the actual state of the cache itself? So uh, we're using time as a way to measure is something in the cache or not in the cache, but it's possible that this will lead to false positives. We might measure something as in the cache when it's not or vice versa. Uh, so this can introduce some error in the process. So we want something that's low noise so we know exactly what's going on at the microarchitectural level. So these metrics are also very uh, easily seen in the traces such as the image of the AS attack that I showed you. Uh, as the spatial and temporal resolution increases, the resolution of those images will also increase. And as the noise decreases, the images will look more and more clear. So we want to maximize uh, these different metrics to perform as powerful a cache attack as we can. And these attacks uh, have been applied several times to both SGX and trust zone. So I'm going to go over a few of them here. The first one is the control channel attack, which was uh, published against SGX. So if we recall, uh, the attacker controls the kernel, 
uh, and the user land, and the victim is the SGX enclave in ring three. So uh, if the SGX enclave tries to access some amount of memory that's currently not in RAM, it's, it's been saved to disk, uh, and it causes a page fault, that page fault will go to the kernel, which is untrusted, and the enclave will say, I need whatever is at this location memory loaded into my process. Now, that memory is encrypted, so we can't see what exactly is in that memory, uh, and we don't know exactly where within that uh, four kilobyte page that the, uh, the victim is trying to access, but we know that there's a particular page of four kilobytes of memory that the victim wants to see. And typically, in a well-behaved system, the kernel will map that page into memory, uh, return control back to the uh, SGX enclave. The SGX enclave will use that memory to continue its processing. So in the controlled channel attack, uh, instead of being well-behaved, the uh, untrusted operating system will look at that page that the SGX uh, enclave is requesting. Uh, it will record that. Uh, the operating system will map that page in, and it will unmap every other page. So we know that when the SGX enclave continues executing, the next piece of memory that it tries to access will not be mapped in. So the victim will try to access a new uh, address in memory, another page fault will occur, and the operating system can load the next page in, unmap all the previous pages, and the operating system essentially gets a view of every new page that is being mapped into the process. So this is a very general attack. We don't need to know the details of the AES algorithm or the RSA algorithm. Uh, all we have to do is just have a general process and we get to see essentially a list of the different pages that that process is trying to access, essentially in order. Now, uh, how does this do on our metrics? The spatial resolution is pretty bad. It's four kilobytes. We can't tell exactly where within this four kilobytes of uh, memory the victim is trying to access, but it's, uh, it's, it's still some information. The temporal resolution is okay, it's not perfect. Uh, we get to see as fast as new pages are accessed, but if one page is accessed multiple times in a row, we won't be able to distinguish that. So uh, temporal resolution is as fast as new pages are, are loaded in. But there's also no noise, because every page fault will have to go through the untrusted operating system, so the attacker will be able to see every uh, access that happens. We can also look at the cache zoom attack, which is another attack on SGX. And the cache zoom attack is based on the question of what happens if there's an interrupt. So typically, if there's an interrupt uh, in your operating system, the operating system will use that for process scheduling or for uh, transferring control or doing different operations. But what happens if there's an interrupt during your execution of your SGX enclave? Well, the answer is the interrupt goes right to the untrusted kernel, and the kernel can decide to do whatever it wants to do with that interrupt. So what if instead of doing what it's supposed to do with this interrupt, uh, it just redirects control to some attack process in your untrusted user land? That's something that the kernel can do because the kernel is privileged enough to receive these interrupts. So with cache zoom, uh, essentially what happens is the untrusted operating system schedules a bunch of timer interrupts. So it allows the victim enclave to execute for a small amount of time. Uh, that interrupt fires, transfers control back to the untrusted operating system, uh, and then the attacker process occurs. So uh, the untrusted code could do the prime part, schedule a timer interrupt, let the enclave execute, the interrupt fires, do the probe step, and so on and so on. So uh, this gives a very clear image. Uh, we can see at the bottom here. Uh, once again, we have time increasing from left to right uh, and access to the different sets from top to bottom. So this is a fairly clear image of what's going on inside the SGX uh, protected memory. Uh, we can do the same with both the data cache and the instruction cache. The basic difference here is the data cache tells you what data the process is accessing. The instruction cache tells you what instructions the process is accessing. And they're, they're handled with different caches uh, and different microarchitectural structures, so we can see the difference in access. This is also a very general attack. It doesn't assume any information about the underlying algorithms. Uh, it just works with any process. Now, the spatial resolution here is the size of a cache line, which is 64 bytes. Uh, memory is loaded into the cache in increments of 64 bytes. So uh, as long as 
two pieces of memory are within the same set of 64 bytes, that's going to show up as the same uh, access to the cache. So we can't tell uh, below the size of 64 bytes. But if two addresses in memory are separated by more than 64 bytes, we can distinguish between those accesses. So our spatial resolution is 64 bytes. <coughs> the temporal resolution here, uh, to quote the paper, is almost unlimited because we can just reduce the amount of time uh, that's in between the timer interrupts. So we can say timer interrupts every one second, timer interrupts every half second, microsecond, and so on. So we can get as small of an interrupt time as we need to for temporal resolution. The noise here is also fairly low. Uh, we're still using time to do this cache attack to see if things are in the cache or not in the cache. So uh, there's still some chance for noise, but it's fairly low. Yeah, question? Uh, I was wondering what can you actually do with this type of cache attack on an enclave, given that the memory is encrypted? Yeah, so the question was, uh, what can you do with memory that's encrypted? So. Uh, some cache attacks are built around the idea that we don't care what the contents of memory are, we just care the offset into memory. So it doesn't matter, uh, I guess one example is with AES, there is a large lookup table called an S-Box, uh, and we know beforehand what's in the S-Box because AES is standardized. But the lookup within that table is dependent on that secret key. So if we know what, where the table is and we know where in the table the victim is looking, then we can learn information about what key the victim is using to perform that lookup. So uh, it's not general in the sense that we can see exactly what's going on in the memory, but a lot of attacks can be built up from the idea that if we can see where the victim is looking, uh, then we can learn enough to be able to learn what secret information they're using. So those two attacks were on SGX, and we can also look at what the attacks are like on Trust Zone. Uh, now, Trust Zone isn't as far developed as the attacks on SGX. So uh, it's a little bit simpler. It's not as developed, but we can look into it nonetheless. So this attack, called TrueSpy, is a prime and probe attack on the Trust Zone memory. Essentially what happens is there's a prime step uh, then it does the full AES encryption, and then it does the probe step. So instead of doing this repeated time step, it's just uh, one single step, one prime, the entire execution, one probe. The reason for this is that in ARMv8, as opposed to SGX, uh, and according to the paper, the secure world is protected uh, and therefore not interruptible. So if this goes back to our diagram of the uh, ARMv8, uh, privilege levels and the different trusted levels. The most privileged level uh, is all in the secure world, so interrupts are trapped by that. Uh, yeah. So does this mean that interrupts cannot happen, like almost when you access a trust zone, it's like an atomic operation, so there's no opportunity for an interrupt to happen to, so that the attacker stops it from that? Yeah, so it, it means that uh, interrupts are handled by trusted code. So the interrupt goes straight to the monitor mode, which is exception level three, which is all trusted. So uh, the attacker does not necessarily get to see the result of this interrupt. Um, so for this attack, uh, they use statistics to reduce this amount of noise from doing this uh, non-interrupted attack. Uh, so our attack here, the spatial resolution is 64 bytes because once again, we're using a memory cache. The temporal resolution is pretty poor here because we only have that one measurement per execution. And the noise uh, is uh, also pretty bad here because we get measurements uh, from user land uh, here just for the specifics of this paper. Measurements are done from user land, so we still have the same measurement noise as before. So this is the, di the diagram that I was talking about earlier. Uh, when an interrupt fires, uh, it goes straight to the monitor mode in exception level three, which is in the trusted code. So uh, since we're operating uh, under the trusted code for this trusted app in Trust Zone, uh, this doesn't return control back to the non-secure code that we as an attacker have control over. But we still need to get interrupts somehow. Linux needs interrupts in order to be able to function properly. So what actually happens in reality is that once the monitor gets an interrupt, it'll just pass it straight on to the kernel. So this goes with your question where 
we still need interrupts. So even though the monitor could stop interrupts at this level, it just chooses not to. So uh, even though the true spy paper was correct that the monitor uh, could trap it, uh, in reality, in modern systems, there is no protection against that. So this raises the idea, and, and sort of the start of my work, where uh, what if we do something like the cache zoom attack, where we use interrupts to uh, interrupt the core that's uh, running the trusted application? So we have the attacker core, which is running our attacker code in the non-secure world, and we have the victim core, which is running the victim code uh, in the secure world. And from the attacker core, we send interrupts uh, because that uh, secure monitor mode will send the interrupts down to the non-secure kernel. Then we can execute a small slice of kernel code, uh, return flow back to the victim, schedule another interrupt, and another interrupt, and another interrupt, and we essentially interleave our victim process with our attacker process. So uh, instead of having one measurement per execution for this trust zone attack, we can once again act like tr the uh, cache zoom attack and get almost unlimited temporal resolution here just by changing how frequently we, we schedule these interrupts to the victim core. So we have okay spatial resolution and okay noise and good temporal resolution, but how will we reduce the noise of measuring these cache misses? Well, what about performance counters? Performance counters on ARM are usually limited to the privilege level, so only the operating system has direct access to these performance counters. But we are the untrusted but privileged operating system, so we have access to these performance counters. Now, these performance counters are used to measure different microarchitectural operations. So you can profile your code to see if there are cache misses, cache hits, cache accesses, and all sorts of other events. So we can use these performance counters uh, using our privilege access to uh, sort of see what's going on within the cache. Essentially, we see how many cache misses have there been so far, try to access memory, how many cache misses have there been so far, and if that number goes up, then we know that that memory access that we just performed triggered a cache miss. So uh, it gives a, a very clear picture of what's going on. Now, unfortunately, if we set up a performance counter and transfer control flow to the secure world, uh, those performance counters aren't going to continue measuring these events in the secure world, uh, and, and that's by default. Uh, that would be pretty insecure if the uh, attacker could see like the number of instructions performed by the secure world or the number of branches or the number of cache misses or all the sorts of sensitive information. Uh, that, that would be pretty bad. But fortunately, ARMv8 does prevent us from seeing uh, and counting these events that occur in the trusted world. The only reason I bring that up is that's not the case in ARMv7. So with ARMv7, we could just set up a performance counter, transfer uh, uh, flow to the secure world, return it to the unprivileged world, and then observe these performance counters and see how many cache misses there were and so on. So we can do this to get a, a very clear view of exactly what's going on in the uh, trusted uh, core by using ARMv7. But ARMv8 is the newest thing. That's the most interesting thing. So we're going to focus on that. And fortunately, this restriction doesn't really limit us that much uh, since our prime step and our probe step only occur in the untrusted code uh, and we're only measuring the events in the untrusted code. It doesn't matter that we can't measure the events within the trusted code. So instead of having some noise from the different uh, measurements, we have virtually no noise at all. Uh, and fortunately, uh, this attack uh, appears that it will always succeed on ARM. We'll always be able to count these events in the non-privileged code. Yeah? Is there any like, attestation schema for ARM applications to verify that they're running on V8 versus V7? Or is, if something was developed to, in order to attack, could you just run it on ARM V7 and still be able to execute the same attack? Or could there be something application level that tests that? Uh, it's completely different code. Uh, like ARM V8 uh, bytecode will not run on an RB7 okay. processor. So, uh, so the instruction set is different enough that it will be Yeah, and, and the other component to that is uh, that there need to be some sort of hard-coded secrets. So uh, one typical way of doing this is to burn in uh, secret keys into your one-time programmable memory on your core. So even if you take that same program and load it onto a different processor, 
that new processor won't have the secrets that are present on the old one. So similar to the version that you used for SGX. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's not the same sort of attestation, but it, it's a similar sense, yeah. So there is some uh, per processor uh, secret material. All right, uh, so we've seen how there are some powerful attacks on SGX, and we've seen how there are some attacks on Trust Zone, but we've also seen how we can make the attacks on Trust Zone more powerful. Okay, I made a tool called Cache Grab uh, that implemented these attacks on Trust Zone. Um, I'll skip through this here since this isn't as important. Uh, but this is essentially what it looks like. So we can see here an attack on Trust Zone that's running on a Nexus 5X. Uh, the top shows an attack on the L1 data cache, so we can see what data the trusted applet is looking at. And the bottom is the L1 instruction cache, so we can see which instructions they're accessing. Uh, and you can see that there is some noise, but you can see that there are clearly access patterns uh, in the data cache. You can see how there are some diagonal lines uh, that go from top left to bottom right. Uh, and that sort of indicates a sequential access to the different sets within a cache. So uh, increasing access as, uh, increasing your address as you increase time. So we're able to use this to be able to look at what's going on in the different trusted applications. But the question is, can we get even better spatial resolution than this 64 byte limit that we've been limited to by using the L1 data in the L1 instruction cache? And on Intel, uh, on SGX, that is possible, in part for something called a branch shadowing attack. So the branch shadowing attack uses something called the branch target buffer uh, to do branch prediction. So when you uh, encounter a branch or an if statement in your code, uh, you want to be able to predict which direction that will take, uh, because that will make your, pro uh, your process run more quickly. So the branch target buffer is a similar structure uh, that's uh, similar to a cache. But instead of uh, comparing the full address uh, to what's in the cache already, uh, it just uh, does a partial comparison. So the reason a memory cache does a full comparison is if you try to access something out of certain memory and you don't compare the full address, you might get returned something from the cache that's incorrect. We don't care as much with the branch predictor because if uh, we try to access something with a partial memory address and the branch predictor says, oh, I think I've seen this before, I remember not taking this before, it doesn't matter if that's the correct address or not. Uh, it'll just uh, maybe tell you the wrong branch prediction. You'll take a small performance hit, uh, but then things will just continue executing anyway once the uh, processor realizes that it took the wrong branch. So. Uh, when I first gave this talk uh, at CCC back in December, uh, I made some throwaway line where, yeah, like what's the worst that could happen by only comparing a partial address? Uh, we don't care about this access. And then about a week later, the Spectre attacks came out, and the Spectre attacks target exactly this behavior, or at least the V2 uh, uh, version, attacks this behavior where, based on this partial comparison, you're able to uh, inject false information into the branch target buffer. So. Uh, I stood corrected, um, but the branch shadowing attack, which came out before then, uh, uses this partial comparison to create collisions within the branch target buffer. So uh, similar to a flush and reload attack, the attack and the victim both share the same contents of the cache uh, since they're able to overlap their addresses within the BTB. So we can do essentially a flush and reload attack using this branch target buffer, which is essentially just a cache attack. So here, our spatial resolution is fantastic. We can see individual branches here. Uh, the temporal resolution is also great because we can do the same uh, interrupt to get almost unlimited temporal resolution. And we have very low noise because uh, we can get very reliable measurements using this branch targeting behavior. Yeah? Is this foreshadow? Basically, is that different? Uh, foreshadow came out later. Foreshadow was, I think, based on a different structure. I think it was the TLB. Okay. So it was um, I don't think foreshadow was. Okay. Yeah, Spectre was definitely the branch target buffer. Uh, oh, was it just a meltdown? Foreshadow is still like part of the SGX interface, but it's like kind of a TLB slip. Okay, bit. that's cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, this was before Spectre and Meltdown. This was uh, one of the precursors to those papers. Um, 
but we can use the ideas of the uh, branch shadowing paper to improve our attacks on trust zone. Uh, the difference here is that for ARM, we don't compare partial addresses for the BTB. Uh, the victim and the attacker don't share those entries as we would in the BTB. So this is more similar to a uh, non-shared memory cache attack, which is a perfect fit for prime and probe. So can we adapt the prime and probe style attack to uh, attack the branch target buffer on ARM? And essentially we can. We do the prime step by executing many attacker branches to prime the BTB with our data. We let the attacker execute, uh, which will uh, evict the BTB entry. And then we do the probe step by uh, executing our branches again, and we monitor the performance counters for missed predictions. So uh, the BTB is uh, a different cache structure, so it has different sizes. Uh, instead of having the typical 256 sets for the L1 data cache, there are 2,048 different sets. So that's going to correspond to our spatial resolution, uh, where instead of having 256 pixels high for our image, we have uh, 2,048. And instead of having these addresses in increments of 64 bytes, uh, it's actually in 16 bytes for the branch target buffer. So instead of being able to see what code is executing uh, every 64 bytes, we can see it down to 16 bytes, which is, is much better. So just to visualize this, uh, this is the outcome of a L1 instruction cache attack. So we have 256 pixels from top to bottom corresponding to our different sets. Uh, and we can see that there's uh, some patterns, some repetition here. Uh, you can see some repeated vertical lines, so you might be able to infer a little bit about what code is executing here. But if we take this L1 instruction cache attack and compare it to the uh, branch target buffer attack, it's much better. Now, the lighting's not great, so we'll focus in on a smaller part here. Uh, so this is just a small fraction of our overall trace, but even with this, we can see that we can uh, observe what's going on in much greater resolution with much greater granularity. We can see the same uh, diagonal lines that indicate uh, accessing sequential branches uh, over time. Uh, we can see clear repetition, which indicates repeated functions or uh, execution within some sort of loop. And we can see much more clearly exactly what's going on within our branch target buffer. So it, it's a much more powerful uh, form of attack than was previously available for uh, trust zone and ARM processors. So what do we do about these attacks? These attacks are clearly very powerful and clearly reveal a lot of information, but how do we protect against them? Well, one approach is to use separate hardware for sensitive operations, and that's what I see as sort of the long-term approach. And that's what hardware manufacturers are actually starting to do. Uh, if the trusted and untrusted code don't actually share underlying market architectural structures, then there's not going to be any information that's leaked between the two. So Apple SSCs have, or as Apple processors have been doing this for a while. I think it goes back to the A7. I might be wrong on that. Uh, but essentially, uh, the most privileged code runs on a separate custom core. So it has different memory. Uh, it has different access. It only has a small interface between that trusted code and the non-trusted code. So uh, we're not going to be able to do the same cache attacks on this sensitive data. The Pixel 2 also includes a, uh, a, a new chip to do the sensitive operations uh, entirely separate from the normal SOC. So again, since this does not have the same memory and does not have the same microarchitectural structures, it is not vulnerable to these sorts of attacks. But unfortunately, we can't do everything this way. Uh, you have to choose what goes in this separate secure hardware and what stays outside of it. Uh, the more things that you put into the secure hardware, the greater the risk that there's some other uh, memory corruption vulnerability or some other uh, classically exploitable vulnerability within this environment uh, so you can get attacker code in this secure environment and uh, perform the attacks that way. So there's a balance between limiting attack surface uh, within these secure environments and uh, being able to get what you care about here. So maybe you care about uh, keeping your uh, authentication keys inside the secure environment, but maybe you don't care about keeping your DRM keys uh, just to uh, separate the privileges. So. It's a good solution. It's definitely going to be more effective uh, than having things on the same memory and with the same structures, but it's not perfect.
And the other solution is to write side channel free software. So if there's no possible way to exploit these side channels, uh, then uh, everything will be fine. Then it's not a problem if the attacker can perform these attacks. So, but again, this is going to be very difficult to convince people to do. Uh, so if you are a developer trying to figure out how to write side channel free software, uh, the things that I, I want you to take away and recognize is that performance is often at odds with security. So you may have to make your code less performant in order to make it more secure. Uh, also recognize that trusted execution environments like SGX and TrustZone aren't magic, uh, aren't magic solutions. They don't protect against everything, and these attacks are still possible. Uh, and these attacks are also very powerful. So we're able to see a lot of information and get a lot of access uh, using our privilege access to these systems. And finally, uh, it only takes one small mistake inside your side channel free software in order to have this all come tumbling down. Uh, one small error is enough to leak a small amount of information which could disclose your cryptographic keys. It could leak any sort of sensitive information. So uh, be very careful, be very wary, and if you don't take the steps to protect your software from these side channels, who will? Thank you. All right. Yeah, so I think the fingerprint stuff is uh, done within the trust zone. Uh, I'm not exactly sure for the 5x or the pixel. Um, yeah. But uh, the control channel attack on SGX was actually done on uh, JPEG decompression, so seeing which pages are loaded. So that attack uh, was essentially looking at can the content of an image be inferred by using a side channel attack. So I've been sort of curious if the same thing is possible here. Can you monitor the uh, fingerprint processing uh, that's occurring in Trust Zone to sort of infer what sort of image is being looked at there? So yeah, can malware read your fingerprint from not secure code? I don't know the details of that. I think with SGX code you can uh, get a lot of information about the processor, like what the microcode patch level is, okay. and uh, probably also if the hypervisor is enabled or disabled. Uh, yeah, the difficulty with the, um, or hyperthreading, sorry, the difficulty with hyperthreading is that uh, you have two different threads that share the same structures at the same time. So. Uh, for teal bleed, I think teal bleed was a uh, essentially the same as the memory cache attacks, except instead of using the memory cache uh, structures like the L1i or the L1d caches, it was using the TLB cache, uh, which is is separate. I think it had the same uh, resolution and granularity and other other factors, but uh, it was just not using the L1i and the L1d caches. It's, it's hard. Uh, it's difficult. I mean, I know it was a performance hit, too. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's worth the risk at this point with just the potential additional vulnerabilities as the technology is still kind of being fleshed out? Uh, I would say, well, it, it depends on what you're doing it for. I say for cryptographic code, I think it's absolutely worth it if it's for a, a high-sensitive application. Like, uh, if you're doing stuff within Trust Zone or SGX and you're using crypto cryptographic code, you should have that hardened against side channels. Like, 
Yeah, so that, that's another one that it, it's possible in theory to protect against that, but going to be very difficult. So you could have a monitor that uh, watches how many interrupts are firing uh, and then determines, is this too many interrupts? Is this uh, some sort of attack that's going on? Should I prevent these? Should I yeah. reset? Yeah. I don't know if you know if that's possible. Yeah, and then you run into the problem of uh, like the past however many decades of processor design and operating system design is, is dependent on these interrupts working and firing when you need them to. Yeah, so if all of a sudden you change that and say, yeah. well, your interrupts might not reach it in time, then that could like cause problems. Be like extremely like high priority, right? Mm -hmm. like Uh, so with cryptographic attacks, there are very common implementation patterns. So uh, you can sort of guess without fully reverse engineering uh, okay. and sort of profile based on what your expectations are on what the uh, attack would look like if these implementation guidelines are followed. Uh, but there are other attacks where you do rely on certain uh, properties of the algorithm. Like there's another attack on SGX that came out after this talk uh, called cache quote, which was a way of uh, leaking those attestation keys for SGX using a side channel attack that relied on uh, the cryptographic implementation return early in some function. So because they analyzed that implementation, they found that it returned early and they're able to monitor for exactly that in order to perform the attack. Okay, so it would probably you have better security or potentially a better chance of protecting it if it's not something people can kind of reference, like running in a protected versus unprotected environment and kind of look for the same aspects at those times and points. Yeah, so trying to obscure what code you're running would be defense in depth. Uh, it wouldn't perfectly uh, fix the issue, it wouldn't uh, protect you completely, but it, it would add additional obstacles, I'd say. Okay. Is it a common approach for once? I guess it would like degrade performance so that you intentionally are, like for, for a side channel that, that there's, you're creating a lot of noise, but then you showed that you're still looking for, you're still like, Extracting re repeated things amongst yeah. like many channels, so that's not a common thing then, because noise you can still extract like repeated. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, for cache attacks, I. I'm fairly certain there aren't any published uh, implementations that protect against this. I don't think there's any published research that protects against it either. Uh, there's also side channel attacks that instead of targeting these cache structures, target things like uh, memory leakage, or sorry, power leakage. Yeah. So uh, their noise is used as a defense. So uh, where you can sometimes infer the cryptographic key by monitoring the amount of power a processor is drawing over time. Yeah. Uh, a white noise is essentially added to that signal to prevent that sort of analysis. Yeah. So. But then you're degrading the performance with that as well. Yeah. yeah. So it, it hasn't quite made it to uh, these sort of, sort of cache attacks. But. I know Intel has these tools. They specifically say that they don't protect against mm -hmm. this. Do they have any published guidelines on how to pr protect against side channels in your software? Uh, Are there any endorsements on that? Or just kind of figure it out with what they've said? So. My source on that was their guideline for like, here's how you do SGX. Okay. The whole part on side channels was essentially just a paragraph like, hey, these could be a thing, but we're not going to protect against them. Uh, so, so they don't even have a recommendation for how to protect from the I, user I don't think they did, no. Okay. I'd have to go back and check the, uh, the document, but I don't think there's really much there. Have you seen any recommendations or kind of in your personal opinion of what would be good to maybe make changes to Intel's design at the hardware level? Would it be a good idea? Because I know, like with the was it the pixel and the other things, actually isolating those physically. Is that something that would be a good idea for Intel to do to their SDX implementation? Uh, it's hard to say because you have to balance uh, performance versus security, and that's going to vary depending on your different applications. So you can't just say, well, this needs to be the most secure thing. Uh, so you need to take every step that you can to secure it. Uh, whereas some 
uh, might not care about the performance they might or might not care about the security they might just want performance so it, it's hard to give a general this is what processors should do uh, because it's very application dependent okay. yeah, I saw some papers that probably I, I don't know the exact details for like ARM it either. It's like commonly understood amongst the, the people who work on it. ARM is le it's harder, it's much harder to do. But yeah, overall, that's a good point too. What would you say is a more secure choice if you're developing something with protected in this way, SGX or ARM, given the current mode of packet integrations? Uh, again, that's going to depend on your application. Like, you can't. But let's say cryptographic. So uh, if you're at that point of being very worried about it, then you could just go with a uh, side channel free constant kind of time implementation. Uh, just the, the nature of my position, I'm, I'm a consultant, so I can't really recommend okay. like <laughs> one route or the other. But I mean, uh, both of them will still be vulnerable unless you protect against the side channels yourself, pretty much. Neither is protected at the hardware level as it's at. Yeah, essentially all modern processors have these shared structures, which are uh, impacted by cash tax in some way. So because unless you're manufacturing something like the Pixels chip or board yourself that does have a totally isolated environment, you have a versus that will really make it on a more intelligent. Yeah, if you use shared structures, then there is, there is risk. Uh, I, I will say that uh, one of the approaches that Intel is taking to sort of combat these attacks is they have uh, cache isolation. Uh, I don't remember the exact acronym they use, but essentially you can schedule processes to only use particular, uh, I think, ways in the cache. So uh, that way your attacker process might evict something from the same set, but uh, they would not evict the victim data. So there, there'd be some sort of uh, cache isolation there. That, uh, Is that the, the tag caching? There's some tagging that can go I think so. I, I think. Yeah, I forget the exact name, but uh, that's one of the uh, approaches that Intel is taking to mitigate these attacks. And that is specifically mitigation to like for this from them? Uh, for cash attacks in general. Okay. Oh, so it's not as checks. That's, that's why it seemed confusing after them saying each other side channels, but I guess if it's affecting everything besides checks too. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, yeah, feel free to come up to me afterwards if you have more questions. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank you guys.